Greetings, I'm Shad, and if you're familiar with my channel, watch, you know, a couple of my videos, you probably have a good under, or an idea, a good idea, that I really like HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. And that's true, I do. In fact, I love martial arts in general. I used to do it very actively as a teenager growing up. I've mentioned that before, some of you might know it, and those of you who don't might be rather surprised about that fact because it doesn't kind of look like it nowadays. Look at me from the side, do I look different to you? That's just the unfortunate result of being married to a wonderful wife who's an incredible cook. Oh, her roasts, so good. Chicken roasts, corned beef. <laughs> no, it's not really her fault, is that I just can't stop when she makes it so good. And I'm not very active these days. That's the result. That's just what happens. It's life, people. But I still have a passionate love for martial arts in general. And throughout the time of, that I used to do it, you, can, you might be able to understand that I did further study. I tried to analyze and figure out what was happening in body mechanics, what techniques were effective and other stuff. And that has given me a decent insight into martial arts as a whole. And of course, when I started to get really involved in sword play, sword fighting, or HEMA, that you might call it, uh, you can understand that I transferred all the philosophies and practices and training systems that I had learned into that as well. Something interesting to point out here is you probably noticed that I defined sword fighting different to HEMA. And a lot of HEMA practitioners do as well. Now it's true that HEMA is sword fighting, but it's also any European style martial art. The other thing about HEMA is that it is historical martial arts okay and there are many people who think that if you are doing a type of martial art even if you're fighting with a sword and it's not a historical style that's explained in treatises it's not real HEMA then and I get that by the definition of HEMA if it's not historical it wouldn't be HEMA it's a historical European martial arts now because of that I actually feel HEMA in the quest of trying to learn how to be the best swordsman you can be actually has a limitation. I might be offending a lot of people when I say that, so, you know, because a lot of my subscribers love HEMA. I love HEMA too, okay? But let's be real here, all right? We, there is an actual limitation in HEMA by being restricted to the historical aspect. Now, the reason why I say this largely comes from the philosophy that I developed as a martial artist and the martial art I practiced. What was the martial art I practiced? Well, I grew up in the country, up in the mountains, and so it was very hard for me to get to uh, martial arts clubs. The first one I did was uh, Taekwondo, but I could only maintain it for a year because the travel was just, I had to travel, it was an hour distance back and forth, so two hours travel just to get to uh, Taekwondo. So I eventually gave it up because it was just too much of a hassle, but even though I gave up going to the club, didn't mean I gave up my individual training. I kept it up at home. I did it very often, more than weekly, in fact. I still have my training equipment, kicking pads, training weapons, uh, heaps of stuff. And I also punched and kicked trees because there's a lot of trees around. I wrapped a rope around a tree and just punched it to try and strengthen up my knuckles. I'm not really sure how effective that technique is as a, as a training technique, all right? So I'm not re actually recommending it, but I did. I punched trees and I also punched the, uh, the uh, tin shed that we had. Uh, so I just, you know, hitting that shed. So I actually consider myself to have been a fairly serious martial artist. Does that mean I did Taekwondo? No, because ever since I stopped going to that club, I also started looking into heaps of other styles, okay? Karate, I loved judo and wrestling. That was one of my strong points, actually. Muay Thai, really awesome, and also jiu-jitsu. But throughout it all, I followed and kept to a philosophy, a training philosophy that is often identified as a martial art, but it's actually not an actual martial art and that is Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do, like I said, is not actually a martial art, it's more a training philosophy, and it's the philosophy developed by Bruce Lee. Fundamentally, Jeet Kune Do is whatever works for you. It's kind of the first mixed martial art, though there's more formal kind of things involved with Jeet Kune Do, but the underlining philosophy of it is keep what is useful, discard what is useless, and keep what is fundamentally your own. And I really agreed with uh, the idea that uh, repetitious movements like carters and stuff like that are actually counterproductive. They, they can be productive, but not nearly as productive as, as other training techniques. And honestly, I found there to be huge amounts of just useless traditional stuff in many different styles of martial arts, especially some, some carters are absolutely pointless. 
And throughout my life, I actually temporarily joined a lot of different martial arts clubs, and I found it very interesting to find many black belts who just couldn't fight effectively at all. And in the same time, there were another group of black belts that could kick the crap out of me. The belt grading system rarely reflected a person's actual skill. And when I went to other clubs, I actually found it fun to employ techniques from other styles that they hadn't trained in. And that was a big way how I would often thrash the black belts of that club because they just hadn't trained. Like in Cridey, many of the clubs didn't focus enough on things like grapples, binds, holds, submissions, and groundwork. And one karate club in particular, called GKR Karate, I actually worked for them for a couple of months there, on the business side. They periodically branched out into grapples and groundwork, but it was very rare as reflected by the ability of the black belts. In the club that I attended, they were hopeless, and the sensei actually got me to help instruct them on how to do it properly. And though I had signed up to their club, I still didn't have any belt in their system. And to this day, officially, I only hold a yellow belt in Taekwondo. And yet, like I've said before, I have come across so many black belts that were just hopeless, that I could just absolutely thrash, and then of course, other black belts who could kick the crap out of me. And all this really just confirmed the philosophy that I followed, that it was better to learn as many different techniques as possible, and take what worked for you, and discard what was useless. Because so many of the clubs that I attended and styles I've studied, though they all have their strong points, had glaring holes in their fighting techniques. Now all this, this philosophy and stuff like that, is also is the same approach that I've taken when I wanted to learn how to sword fight. When I started pick up, when I first picked up a sword and started working out how it, you know, moved and did research, and I mean, I went to Japan, I got to study kendo and stuff like that. I was a bit disappointed because I don't really consider kendo authentic sword fighting. Okay, I, I kind of I consider it more of a sport, but there are excellent training techniques in kendo that I would still use to this day. Okay, and the footwork is great. So you take what is useful, discard what is useless, and keep what is fundamentally your own. That's what I've always done. And as I eventually came to discover HEMA and other things like that, and looking at all the different techniques and styles that exist around there, the standard stances and such, I've honestly found a lot of stuff that just is useless to me. It doesn't work for me. For instance, uh, low stances, stances where you hold the sword low, all right? I have found I have a very natural instinct to protect my legs whenever I see a move, an attack or anything that's even coming close towards it, and I naturally am able to move my legs and dodge the attack, then needing to block it with my sword. And that's when I spar and train and stuff like that with swords. That's one of the main ways in how I actually get a hit on my opponent, is that I come in for a low attack, and I just naturally move my legs back without even thinking. I don't need to try hard to do it. It's just what I naturally do. So it works. I'll go with it. So when my guard is up, my natural instinct, if I ever, if I ever see or feel, you know, notice an attack coming in for my legs, will be to do this, okay, and to move back. And you'll see it. I'm kind of doing this weird pirouette kind of move. It looks odd, okay. It also looks a bit unwieldy, but I've found it to work quite effectively. So their attack will come in. I'll move back. Usually, you know, adopt a longer stance like that. But see your counter and hit back. Do a bigger cut or any number of things. And I've had some people saying, oh, you keep your feet too far back in your stance and stuff like that. But again, you know, you, we need to understand what works for people and what doesn't. You see, for me, that style, that stance works really effectively so far. If I ever come up against someone who's able to counter it completely, well then of course I'll have to adapt my style. But so far, like I said, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is it a historical technique? I've never saw a technique that focuses like that. Now, if a HEMA club ever opens up, close to me, locally. I'll be there fast as anything. But if they ever try and tell me, no, no, you need to stop doing this, okay, because your footwork's all wrong, I wouldn't do it, okay, because I don't follow that philosophy in martial arts. And that's what I mean when I say I see a limitation in HEMA. Because in the quest of just trying to learn how to fight well with a sword, there can be an overemphasis on the historical thing. And indeed, people will say, if you're not doing something historical, it's not even HEMA. And that can actually be fully counterproductive to the way someone would naturally fight and move when they use a sword. And the other point why I think that's a limitation is I feel my approach, even if I lived in the historical period, would be as legitimate as it is now. I understand the limitation that, uh, you know, we don't live in that period, so we're not actually trying to kill ourselves or in a real duel and other things like that. And there is a, you know, an idea that spread throughout the sword enthusiast community that 
a modern sword practitioner can never be as good as someone who existed in history. I think that idea is bullcrap, okay? For one, not everyone in history used a sword. So anyone who even has the basic understanding of how a sword is used would be better than that historical person to begin with. Okay, what if someone, what about the people who actively practice with a sword? There's always varying levels of skill. And guaranteed, you will, you know, if you're pretty good with a sword, I guarantee you could find many people in history that you could thrash. And likewise, you will find, of course, people who could thrash you as well. And that's the same in the real modern world, okay? I, only one person can be the best person in the world. So if you're not that one person, which is basically all of us, all right, Guaranteed, there's always going to be someone who can beat you, and even that pe person in the world, they'll also get beaten too, okay? There is no unbeatable swordsman, that doesn't exist. So I actually believe that in the quest to learn how to fight well with a sword, anything that works is legitimate. And if it works for you, I don't think you should disregard it just because it's not contained in a historical treatise. It doesn't mean you ignore historical treatises, okay? Because they do come at it with a, a level of experience that again, yes, we will never have that level of experience. It doesn't mean they're always right, okay? Because you know how your body moves, you know what works for you more than other people, but it doesn't mean we should disregard it. You should always look at, okay, that's how they're explaining it. If it's different to what you do, I I'm gonna take it, I'll give it a try. I'll see if it works better for me. And if it doesn't, don't take it on board. Use what works for you. That is a far better training philosophy in my mind than anything else. And uh, I've done martial arts ever since I was pretty young, okay? And I found that philosophy, the Jeet Kune Do philosophy, to be the best martial arts training philosophy I've ever come across. What I'm saying doesn't apply to all HEMA schools or all HEMA practitioners. I'm very confident that there are many, you know, schools, practitioners out there that think the way I do. Of course, I have come across other HEMA philosophies that look down and kind of frown upon any technique that is used that is not historical, which I think is silly, okay? I honestly reckon if it works, it's legitimate, and even the people in the his, his, you know historical context way back then would have regarded that the same way. The master would see it and say, well, if it works to you, use it, which in my mind makes it essentially HEMA as well. What do you think? Do you agree with me that there can be a limitation in HEMA if there is an overemphasis on the historical point to the extent that they won't allow techniques or uh, styles that are not shown in historical treatises? Or do you disagree with me? Do you think that it's far more important to maintain what traditional historical swordplay is as we can try and understand it to be according to the sources that we have? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and until next time, farewell! If you'd like to support Shadowversity, or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.